Welcome to episode 22 of the Total Hockey Training Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Scahan. And before I introduce my next guest, I just want to remind everybody, Total Hockey Training, the online training program, is available at Train Heroic. 39 bucks a month, seven days free if you want to try it out. And also, again, to all my listeners out there, if you like the show, please like it and share it. Um, we have a great guest today a uh, little different message but a great story that i want everyone to know about and this next guest is jacob newton jacob is a current mental performance and emotional control coach and he's a former professional hockey player and i know him because he signed with anaheim back in 2010 out of northeastern university he is from san jacinto california Jacob, great to see you, and welcome to the show, pal. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and again, thank you so much for for allowing me to be a guest on this podcast. I don't, I haven't been keeping count, but I would probably put this in the twenty five to thirty range of of podcasts that I've guested on. And again, just to have the the connection that we have, and my my first couple years pro, um, you know, training under you those summers and everything. Again, I think this is just it's like. It's fascinating how life kind of comes full circle. Um, so to be on this podcast with you, reflecting on the things that I went through in my life, I just think it's so powerful. So again, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I appreciate that. Yes, I remember vividly you signed out of Northeastern. And I want to go, uh, before all that, you grew up in San Jacinto. Now, I lived in Anaheim Hills, California, in Orange County. Where about is San Jacinto? Yeah, so it's uh, it's going to be from from Anaheim Hills. You're probably looking about an hour and a half. Um, so Anaheim Hills, you're right off the 91 freeway there. You would take that. Yeah. Uh, what is I don't even know anymore. It's been so long since I've lived there. I want to say uh, you would take it east. I don't know. Chino, um, through Corona. Yeah, yeah. Go through Chino. You would go through Riverside, California, and you continue okay. heading towards Palm Springs. Okay. Um, so I lived about 25, 30 minutes away from Palm Springs growing up in, a, in that small little town. Um, and just so you're aware, it's San Jacinto. Okay, um, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It, it, it's irrelevant to me, but just so that you know that you're pronouncing it uh, the right way. Um, but yeah, like I said earlier, it was rated, I don't know what year this was, maybe 2019, 2020, rated the fourth worst city in the whole state. Oh, wow. um, so many different, you know, reasons yeah. why crime, housing prices, the weather, how close you are to the beach, how close, like the closest highway to us growing up was about 35 minutes away. Um, so you would get to nothing and you go past that and then you'll find San okay. Jacinto. Is that like near, is there Hemet? Is that the name? Yeah, of the right. Yeah. Right next, right next to Hemet. Yep. Remember going to Hemet because they had Thomas, the Thomas, the train museum there when my little guy was young and we went wow. down and uh, I remember Hemet, so I can, I can only imagine, uh, you know, I remember going through that town and seeing, okay, this isn't Orange County by any means, right? No, no. Yeah. And again, you know, signing with Anaheim and playing youth hockey in, in California, going to Los Angeles, going to San Diego, playing, you know, at Anaheim Ice there, mm -hmm. the drive into Orange County was the most greatest drive. Everything went from being brown and dead in the desert, yeah. so there was so much life in Orange County, but the drive the other way was such a depressing drive. That's what I mean. Brutal, brutal is in the traffic. The traffic must have been hectic, right? Oh yeah, for sure. When I when I played for the Junior Kings, it was a hundred miles to El Segundo. Yeah, uh, I can only imagine. Because, yeah, and in that California traffic, we were probably around three to three and a half hours to get there, and then the same amount coming home. So I I would spend six seven hours in the car four or five days a week do homework on the way to the rink and then sleep on the way home but you're getting home you know i was getting home at like midnight one o'clock every every night after practice um so there was a lot of sacrifice that took place from my family members sacrificing for me to be able to play this game you know um had my mom not worked for united airlines at this time in youth hockey i don't know how i would have been able to play this sport mm -hmm. uh, not not coming from money, having two brothers, two sisters, adopting three cousins, um, eight kids, you know, with then mom and dad. 
Um, all of my equipment was hand me down or we, we shopped at played against sports. And uh, <laughs> literally my first ever time playing ice hockey, I had a CCM skate on my right and a Rydell on my left. <laughs> And uh, that, it didn't matter to me. I was just so dang happy to be finally switched to, to ice hockey because I had started out in roller um, yeah. because now, that's so all they had in my, in my town. So how did you get into hockey then? You, you you just said you started out with roller and then did you go right to the Junior Kings or did you go to the Ontario Reign, one of those programs, something like that? Yeah, so those uh, the Junior Kings wasn't until like my fourth year of ice. So I started out in roller hockey and – purely started because I'm half Canadian. My mom, both my sisters and my oldest brother were all born in uh, Alberta. And so it's just part of part of the family, you know? And so we, again, we started out playing street hockey and then we found out there was a roller hockey rink in our hometown. So we, I played roller until I was 11 and then made the switch over to ice purely because the closest ice rink was like an hour and 15 minutes away. And ice wasn't as popular at this time as, as roller hockey was in California. Um, but no, once, once I made that transition at 11, I played a year of in-house of rec rec level in Riverside at Riverside ice town, sure. which I know is still there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a couple years, a couple more years there squirts. And then yeah, year four was when I finally made the jump to playing like something higher than single a hockey yep. squirt a. Then yep. I played, uh, PB triple a with, with the junior Kings, my, that, uh, I don't okay. even know how old I would have been, but. The year that it was actually 2002 it was the year I went to the Pee Wee Carnival tournament um, in Quebec. Yeah, yeah in Quebec yeah. there. I, I, I did it with the Junior Ducks. So, again, it's just crazy to think that I signed with the Ducks and I have a history with playing with the youth club, you know. Um, and so, yeah, then it was just more bopping around until I eventually moved away from home at the age of 15 to, to play Junior B in the Northern Pacific Junior Hockey League in uh, Oregon. I don't even know if that league's around anymore, but, wow. um, yeah, that was, uh, probably at the height of the depression that I was experiencing was that year, a year when I really needed, I just needed family that year and probably more years than that, you know, but now I'm 15 years old living with a housing family and it was chaos that first year. Um, I remember one, one, my second billet family that year, you know, waking up to go to school and the housing dad being up at five, five thirty in the morning, and he's already drinking, already drinking, chewing tobacco so early. And so again, at the age of 15, I'm so impressionable at this time in my life. And this is what I see, you right. know, um, luckily I was very shy and innocent back then. I didn't really participate in any of the partying. And it wasn't until I then went home for my senior year, played for the junior Kings again, um, and then the next year I, I moved away to play in the North American league with the Texas tornado. Okay. Um, and at that time they were, it, they were notorious for being a party team. Okay. They won all the time, the one yeah. all the time. So me going there, I wasn't thinking about the partying. I was thinking about the reputation of winning that this sure. club, had, you know? And so I was so excited um, at that time to be gone, but that was the year when, yeah, I got really introduced to like some actual fame playing in this town in Frisco, Texas. I know it's a lot bigger now. This mm -hmm. is you know, back in 2006. And yeah, some popularity, some fame. And then you get introduced to these parties and alcohol. And my father was an alcoholic growing up. So I had a feeling that this was what my form of suppression was going to be, was going to be an alcoholic myself. Um, so I, I abused alcohol for the next like five years. Um, so crazy, Sean, to think how I used to perform on the ice and how I was able to perform like that. Mm -hmm. Um, going to things I was doing away from the rink, I was always performing, whether I'm on the ice performing, I was off the ice performing as well. And so much of my inner happiness came from other people being happy with me. So I was lost in people pleasing. And this was from that year until shoot probably year three of my career, year four, um, while I was still in the, in the American League, it was very much the same. Getting getting the calls from the boys, the texts from the boys wanting to know what I was doing, man, that filled me up. It was like, wow, these guys like me. I didn't like myself, but this was how I was able to like myself was, again, these other guys calling me, wanting to hang out, you know? And so um, 
for about five years. I, yeah, I, five nights a week, I, I drank with the intent to black out. So at this time playing juniors, we play Friday, Saturday, Saturday after the game. That's when it would start Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, recover on Thursday and then do it all over again. And my biggest enabler at that time was I was having such success on the ice, mm -hmm. you know? And so I did, I was blinded that something was wrong in my life because of how, again, how I was performing in the one area of my life that I loved. And that was, that was hockey, you know? So there was nothing telling me that anything was wrong again, because of, I was the go-to guy, you know? Um, and I was the go-to guy on every team I played on until I signed with Anaheim. Mm -hmm. Then I was surrounded by guys that were the go-to guys on every team prior and now all of these underlying insecurities started creeping up, you know, like me thinking I was going into Anaheim to replace Scott Niedermeyer. Like what a naive thing of me to think, you know, especially like year one, you know, right. right. And that, and that's exactly where my mind was. It was Cam Fowler. Yeah. He, he, you know, creeped down the, the draft and Anaheim got to select him. He was, I didn't even think about him. I, obviously I knew he was drafted. I was a free agent, but I had so much confidence at that time coming in, you know, and it wasn't until I got sent down that again, so much of this, these demons, these things started coming up. And at that time, I didn't know what the heck was happening. You know, wow. uh, our minds are so powerful and it protected me so that I didn't have to think about the things that I experienced as a child for 18 years. I didn't get any type of help. Hockey was my help. Hockey was my way to run away from the things that kept trying to reveal themselves to me, you know, from a, a deeper aspect. Um, so I have a, a tendency when I'm telling my story to kind of jump around to different things. So maybe you've, uh, oh. you're experiencing that, but, um, you know, just kind of want to bring it all back to, you know, again, the things that I experienced as a child. And, you know, I had mentioned earlier that we adopted three cousins um, when I was a kid, after my mom's brother passed away, uh, again, leaving behind these three children and then his wife, who was unfit to be a mother, let alone a single mother. So we then adopted these three. Um, what my parents didn't know then. And so because they didn't know, I, I hold no grudge or no judgment towards them. You, you don't know what you don't know. Right. But all three of them had been sexually abused um, in their own lives. And then it, I don't know exactly how long after we adopted them that that type of abuse started happening uh, to me by my by the oldest of the cousins. So I was five when it started and he was, I think, at that time, 16, 17 years old. Um, and so because he had had it done to him, in my mind, maybe I'm naive here, but this is how I feel now after doing all the work I've done is that because he had it done to him as well even though he might have known in his conscious mind that this is wrong, it's it's just normal. This is what we do because it was done to him. The person that did it to him had it done to him. And so it's just this vicious, vicious cycle. Um, and I'm just so happy that I've woken up to that cycle and get to be the cycle breaker now so that I don't hand this down to my kids, you know, um, and to anybody uh, that I come in contact with, you know, it's, um, it's very easy for me to talk about it now because of how much I've talked about it, you know, but you know, again, now you fast forward to that first game with Anaheim to give people now some more context on why I was so afraid out there, you know, like I was in fight or flight mode the moment that first fight happened. And again, me being the big guy that I am, I was like, Holy shit. Like somebody's going to ask me to fight for sure. And if they do, I have to say yes. I got to prove myself that I, if something happens, that I'm a guy that would be willing to step up. But just the thought of that terrified me. And again, at this point in my life, I didn't know why, because my mind had shut all of those memories, all that pain away. So I would just have this physical reaction, you know, um, and I would shut down. I would be in fight or flight mode. And anybody pushed me, I froze, completely mm -hmm. froze. And I was looking at them as if this person was my cousin. And again, I'm no longer this big guy, 21 year old, 22 year old. I'm now five year old Jake again, you know? Um, and so playing the game with that type of fear, obviously, you know, good luck having success, even though I was still able to, 
But again, once it got to the NHL level, that's when I didn't stand a chance in succeeding at that level because of all of uh, the things that happened, you know. Um, but now with where I'm at in my life, it's uh, where I'm at mentally and the resiliency that I have and the, the work that I've done on myself. I know now that had I had this level of awareness and this type of guidance, then I believe I would still be playing in the NHL. Um, but again, it's uh, that was never going to be my experience. Um, I was always going to experience the abuse. I was always only going to sign a contract with Anaheim, never have a career in the NHL. And it's all to create a platform for myself so that I can share my story to help the men out there, the people out there that are suppressed, that are suffering in silence. And, um, you know, reading the articles on me or listening to this podcast, I only hope that it's like the keys to help somebody to unlock them from their own prison that they're living in, you know. Um, so, yeah, I know I've talked a long, long time here if you wanted to <laughs> come oh, in. Wow. Well, one, thanks for sharing all of that. Holy shit. Um, you know, I want to go back to, you know, I just, it's important to note that these, these kids from California, you know, people might say, oh, they have it nice out there. No, what Jacob just talked about, like, it's tough for those families to get them to the rink, you know, and that's what a lot of these kids have to do in SoCal. You know, you have the Junior Ducks, you have the Junior Kings, and those are the the, the premier AAA programs, and those are the, the teams you want to be on. And a lot of sacrifices have to be made from those families and those kids. You know, there's a lot of time in the car, like Jacob mentioned, you know, a lot of time on the 91 freeway or the 5 or the 405. I remember those freeways because I was one of those parents as well. It, it, it's a it's tough. You know, you, you got to go to Anaheim Ice in Anaheim. You got to go from to El Segundo from wherever. And, and Jacob's talking about where he's from. And if you want to be a good hockey player, those are the sacrifices that you have to make. And, uh, Kudos to a lot of those Southern California families who do that to help to help their child pursue their dreams and live their passion of being a hockey player. Now, Jake, Jacob, so I guess, you know, listen to your story, which is just um, real, obviously. Hockey was your escape. Hockey was your way to, you know, not being your subconscious mind, I should say, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was my way to, and again, you know, having the the awareness that I have now, when I speak about the person I was then, I I ha didn't have this, or I had it. It was just blocked through trauma, through life experiences, as I was kind of hardened, you know. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's it's it it was wild. It was wild to again go through all of that and then try and, and succeed in hockey. And I played the game without fear until again, until really until the NHL, even though obviously fighting and checking was obviously a part of every level I played at. Um, the, the fear wasn't really there. It really didn't come until I was no longer the guy and adversity had struck. I didn't know how to manage that. I didn't know how to ha manage myself in the face of adversity, right. you know, um, yeah, like when I when I did get sent down after that preseason game where I had a goal and an assist, um, the next day I got sent down and now I'm in Syracuse and my coach is there, wanted me to play a different style of game, you know, and that was the first thing. Well, what do you mean change my style now? Like I made it here being the offensive defenseman. Why would I why would I switch now? It's like the wrong time to switch, you know. Um, and I was so resistant to that. They wanted me to be more physical and I, I was never that guy. I was never that guy. And again, I understand now why I wasn't. Um, but even if I would have tried then it would have been so fake and I would have been exposed. I feel like had I taken that, uh, approach, you know, um, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's important to know too, like when you're working for the organization or, any organization or any sport, any players, you know, come into your organization, you have this thought of like, they're really talented. They've worked their asses off to get here. No question. But you never know what's really going on inside someone's head. And I think that's important to like, think about 
you know, you, you think, oh, this kid has made it, you know, like lucky him. He's, he's got his big contract sometimes. And it's like, okay, now it's time to get to work, you know, and sometimes you're not the, the big fish in the small pond, right? As you alluded to earlier, you walked into a locker room with, I don't know, was Pronger on that team then? Or was he? No, no, okay. Pronger, no. Anyways, you had, you had a Hall of Famer defenseman and you had, you had Cam Fowler, who's still playing for the Ducks now, which is unbelievable. Right. You, you had, uh, you probably had. We had Getzloff, Perry. Yeah, yep. Yeah, those guys, absolutely. Saku. Saku. Jason Blake. <laughs> and Timo, of course. Like, you had these guys who have arrived and who've done it for a long period of time. And you, yeah. you were just getting going in your professional life. So, you know, talk about, I guess, okay, talk about the next few years then from Syracuse and I know you you ended up transitioning to Europe. Um, you know, talk about those years there, and you know, where you're, how are you getting through it? How are you managing that when you knew, okay, this is I'm not the I'm not the most talented guy on the team anymore. I'm not the guy anymore. I have to find a way in professional hockey. And talk about how you how you coped with with, with that stress on your life. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great question there because I. I I talk a lot about it and I think a lot about it at, at times is I went from an NHL contract. That was my dream growing up. I was, it was a dream to have a career, but you know, the fact that I got to sign that contract with Anaheim, like, again, I received my first check on top of the world. I had never seen that type of money before, you know, but you know, so I signed that three year, I went to Anaheim right away. If you remember, yes. um, Absolutely. which wiped, wiped a year off. You know, um, and so it was essentially just a two year contract. So the two years is done. I wound up getting traded the next year to Colorado, which is what eventually led me to here in Cleveland, where I currently reside. Okay. Um, and things were great when I first started here. Like the coaches loved me. They loved my style of play. Um, and then it got to a point where I would play a game and then I would sit six, play a game, sit five. And then I eventually got sent down to their central hockey league uh affiliate because they didn't have an east coast affiliate and when i had gotten sent down i went back to a town that was a town over from where i played juniors for the texas tornado and i got okay. right back into old habits uh the okay. drinking the partying whatnot um and then eventually again the next year now i go from this nhl contract to getting an offer from the second italian league the second italian league and i didn't even know that there was a first Italian league, you know, and so <laughs> now here I am, I'm in Italy in this small little village and it's more a hobby for these guys. This is my career. It's a hobby for them. They have nine to five jobs and then they come to practice that night and they maybe get paid like 25 euros a day. Um, and so every day after practice, Sean, I, I'm not joking. I'm taking a knee. I'm, I'm talking with a goalie. He spoke very good English. He was a true professional. Um, but I would be taking a look at my teammates and a lot of them would be tripping over themselves because they just weren't that good at hockey, which <laughs> is fine. But I got to the point where I was like, what happened? <laughs> what happened here <laughs> going from a three-year entry-level contract to the second Italian league? And I got, you know, player of the year that year and we won the championship and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm good again. <laughs> you know, not that I was bad, but that was the moment where I was like, oh, this is me. I'm the common denominator in every single problem in my life. So now it's time to take a look at myself and start to examine the things I'm doing, how I'm speaking, but then being like not living with integrity, you know? Um, and so that was the year I started to understand, okay, if I'm the problem and I have been the problem all along, then who is the solution? I am the solution as well. So that's when I started reading like, mental toughness books, sports psychology books, really started to understand, okay, there is something more here that I'm missing. Physically, I was right there with anybody, with everybody, but it was my lack of the mental, the mental skills that is ultimately what again, led me away from the NHL. But now here I am, I'm back in like a, a position of power because now I get to make healthier choices, you know, um, so then again, started reading the book, started implementing and applying these things into my life. And then I was able to build myself back up over in Europe. Um, okay. wound up playing over there for seven years. I'm, and to be honest with you, I'm far more grateful 
for those seven years than I am for signing an NHL contract. Purely oh, because that's powerful the, right there. Yeah, just like the different life experiences, and I'm not there visiting. I'm there living. I'm I'm entrenched in the culture of these. It was six different countries that I played in. Um, so I got a lot of experience, and I've got a lot of support over in Finland. Got a lot of support in Italy where I first played. You know, um, so cool. My son was born in Finland my first year over there, and um, in 2015, and his birthday is just the day before mine. And oh, that's uh, cool. So, yeah, so. Yeah. His mom and I decided that we would give him a Finnish middle name. So his middle name is my name in Finnish, which is Jako, J-A-K-K-O. Obviously, you've heard that name a few times in, yeah. in your in your Absolutely, time. But, yeah. But yeah, no, Europe was uh, just, again, the culture, the Christmas markets, you know. Um, and then I still had hope, though. I still had the motivation to get back to the NHL level. Especially mm -hmm. because I was climbing, I was getting to, you know, I eventually went and I got to the first Italian league. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're heading in the right direction, you know. And then uh, my daughter or my then wife was pregnant and we wanted to go through that experience home. So I went one year, Europe, came right back home. That year I played in the East Coast League with the Ontario Reign. I eventually got called up to Bridgeport. Okay. Uh, right. I was at a half point per game that year as a defenseman. I was like, okay, maybe I can stay here. Um, but then, boom, next year, right back to Italy. First league. Okay. And then I went from the first Italian league to the top Finnish league, um, which which is pretty I – don't, I don't know if that happens over in Europe. I've not seen that before. But the night that this team from Finland came to watch me play, I had a four-point night, two goals and two assists, and they wanted me to come to Finland like – the very next day. Um, and so I got into a bit of an issue with that team from Italy that year. They didn't want me to leave. And um, anyhow, wound up over in Finland. And I was like, okay, here I am. I'm in a very respectable league playing against Patrick Lyon, Sebastian Aho, Jesse Pugliarvi, playing against all these guys in their you know native country, which was so cool. Um, and then Czech Republic the next year, another very respectable league. Back to Finland for another year where I was wearing the golden helmet and over in Europe, if you're wearing the golden helmet, you're the leading scorer. Um, and so that year, which was again, 2017 was the year I started really tapping into more like mindfulness, um, uh, mindfulness practices, whether that's meditation, um, breath work was a big thing for me and still is in my current life, um, visualization. And that was the best season I had of my career. And I was so close to Sean to getting selected to Team USA that year um, because that was the first year that they didn't send NHL players to the Olympics. Right, the, the, the Olympics in Russia, correct? Yeah, Sochi, yeah. Sochi, um, yeah. Yeah, and that year, again, you know, wearing that golden helmet, I wore, I don't know, right around 30 games that year. Wow. Um, and I knew in November it was the Deutschland Cup and Team Canada and Team USA alternate years that they're going to send a team. I knew this was the year Team USA was going to, and I knew that that tournament was going to be like a tryout for the Olympics. And so I really was trying to make it onto that roster. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And then a, right after my point production, like the next three games, I had like 12 points, went home for Christmas break, came back, get a call from my agent, Team USA wants you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. I was so intentional. I was drawing myself in like a Team USA drawing my jersey in the locker room, drawing yeah. the board, last goal scored by Jay Newton. I was so <laughs> intentional with trying to manifest this, you know, and then to get that call, they want you. And I was like, this is great. And he goes, but. Yeah. And, the but came. and the but was that I wouldn't have had enough time to go through the uh, WADA testing protocols before like opening ceremony. I guess there was all this paperwork and everything. I don't know, but just to get the acknowledgement of that was a sign that all of these practices that I had started implementing into my life was working, you know? Um, yeah. And then eventually wound up, wound up in Sweden and then Norway and then boom, 2020, okay. it was all done. Was there a time when you transitioned, I guess is the word I'm looking for from like maybe how you were, maybe when you got sent down to Syracuse into that person who 
you know, shouldn't have been on that second league in Italy. Like what happened during that time? Like what got you from, was, was there, was there therapy that took place? Was there just daily habits and routines, a little bit of both, or was there, what was it that helped you make that transition to kind of what it sounds like to me, enjoying the game? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, again, like once I started realizing that I was the problem again at that time. I, I wasn't in in therapy, but I was just reading these different books. Actually, um, my buddy, good buddy of mine, his name's Greg Malden. He's still playing. He's yeah. like forty four years. You know him? He was he coaching at the UN USNTDP. Yep. And then he went back to playing from UMass. He went back to playing. Hey. Yeah, yeah. This is like his his third year now in in uh, Norway. Uh, they're in playoffs currently. He's from UMass. Um, I remember him. Yeah, UMass. Uh, was he, was he yeah. with Columbus at, at one time? Was he? Yep. Yeah. He was. Yeah, with Columbus. He was with Colorado, and that's he and I played together here for the the Cleveland Monsters in 2011 together. Okay. Um, okay. And then wound up like both going over to Europe same year. Um, he went to the, the top Swiss league, the NLA. I, I think it, they may have switched their names now. So he was there, and I was the second Italian league. And he was like, "Man, I think you should." pick up this book and the book was called mind gym. I'm sure you've, you've heard of it. Um, yeah, I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that was the first one that just got really got me into understanding that there's these thoughts. The untethered soul was obviously another big uh, shift for me was that I can control what's going on up here. And if I can control what's going on up here, knowing that there is a connection between mind and body, if I can control my thinking, I can then to a certain degree control how I feel which has an immediate impact on my energy levels and therefore my effort and then ultimately my performance on the ice. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it wasn't always easy though, to be honest with you, because the more work I started doing on myself, the more it started to create a space for this old stuff to really start coming up. And that was, that was the trauma that I had shared about earlier, you know, mm -hmm. um, and realizing like, holy crap, there's a, like, I've, I've gone so high. I've climbed the mountain, so to speak. And it's like, once I got to the top of the mountain, I looked out and I realized, whoa, there's, there's a valley to, that I need to enter into. There's so much deeper that I need to go, you know? And, um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I would say that again, just, just realizing that I'm living out of alignment. I'm living for other people. And living for other people has led me into a life of misery. I was miserable, um, but I was always programmed and told to just choose joy. My mom, thank thankfully, she infl you know infused me with positivity. But I was being very fake on the outside and on the inside. I was in turmoil. Um, essentially, yeah. Again, like I said, probably the first four years of my career um, was was me lost, so lost. But uh, I'm so grateful now that I've done the work that I've done to be, uh, you know, like a beacon for other people, a beacon of light, a beacon of love and um, no judgment. It's just such a deeper level of understanding now into myself and then through that into to, to people outside of me um, that I could have just any seen a homeless person is a reminder of how my life could have gone mm -hmm. and where I was. And I was decisions away from that life, you know. Um, so yeah, no, again, like I said, just extreme gratitude for it all. And I wouldn't change anything. I know the, the abuse people think, oh, wouldn't you take that back or not have that done to you? No, it was always going to be that. That was always going to be my platform right there. So God, the universe, whatever you believe in, like that was going to always be in my path. And I've accepted that. And the same thing with my career, I was never going to have that career in the NHL, the two were just going to help me to help the world, so to speak, you know? I love it. And so I was, I was telling you before we got started here, like you look better than you did 14 years ago. Physically, you look like you have a brightness around you just by looking at you through the camera here, which is awesome. So really, really awesome, like I, like I just said. So talk about what you're doing now you know, what is the, the mental performance and emotional control coaching? Talk, talk about that. You know, wh where are you going with that? And, and what is life like for you right now as Jacob Newton? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, the mental performance stuff, 
outside of being a father, this is this is my purpose. It's it's my deepest passion to provide players with very to very easy to apply and applicable tools into their day to day life to help them to negate so many mistakes. So I'm primarily working with hockey players, but I'm not working on them necessarily for hockey. My approach is to develop the person to develop the athlete. So I guide players on no different, everything I teach, I use in my life and I used in my life for the last seven years to become the person that I am now. Um, so again, a lot of it is just that mind body connection. The very basis foundation of my teaching is getting them to understand their mind, helping them to reprogram their subconscious mind so that they can just create more positivity in their life. Um, and then it, all the other stuff as well, the mindfulness stuff, a lot about meditation, because for me, when I first started meditating, that was the most consistent I played and the most patient and poise I had with the puck. Um, and this is in Finland now, and it was the best statistical season I had. So it's like, yes, it might, there might still be this like woo woo around meditation around you know, visualizing, but the more players are just willing to be intentional and consistent and just give it an honest effort, you're going to start getting results, you know? So um, the emotional control aspect certainly comes from the breath work. Um, I've been doing it now for seven years and I went through a, a breath work instructor's course. So I've got a certification in that, in that area to again, be able to help players with proper breathing. Um, we've always been told to, you know, hands on top of our head, and breathe this way, which makes it very difficult to use your actual breathing muscle, which is the diaphragm. Yeah. And, you know, so many players are breathing so shallow into the upper part of their lungs, which is keeping them in that high stress state, the fight or flight mode, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's when you breathe deep into your belly that you're able to switch into that parasympathetic and mm -hmm. get into rest and recovery. So it's, it's something that is so powerful that every single human has access to. We've just never been guided on how to properly breathe, you know? Um, so th that, that goes into play at the gym for these players in between shifts in a game, you know, mm -hmm. in between reps at a practice, you know, so getting them to be able to belly breathe has been so powerful again, not just for myself, but for them to experience it, do it, and then realize, holy crap, my recovery has been expedited because of I'm breathing just into yeah. my belly, you know? Yeah. This is a this is a hockey training podcast, but yeah, one hundred percent diaphragmatic breathing in between shifts, no brainer. Yeah, um, at nighttime, you want to go to sleep, diaphragmatic breathing. <laughs> you know, I I experienced it too. I I remember when I learned about it. I used to have a, I was a big chest breather, and I had an asthma inhaler, and I I was, you know, that was my lifelong. I thought until I learned how to breathe through my belly. And I, I teach it all the all the all the time as well in, in my facility. Um, yeah, that parasympathetic shift, I think that's key. Yeah. It's the stress, right? Well, for sure. And when you think about it, like hockey or just life in general, we want to be present. We want to be mm -hmm. in the present moment. And everybody again talks about it, but how do you how do you get there? And to mm -hmm. me, it's it's the breath. The breath is what keeps you in the here and the now. So even more so, like Again, this is a training podcast. After a mistake is made on the ice, it doesn't serve you to get on the bench and be hypercritical of yourself. And be very off and pissed off, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Which is like keeping you tense and rigid. We want to be, we want to have a calm confidence on the ice, you know? And so if, again, you're in between shifts and you're tapped into your breath. It's keeping you here now, not focused on the mistake that was just made, not worried about if I'll make the same mistake again. It's just keeping you here now. You stay focused on your breath for 30 seconds, a minute, boom, get up on the bench, start scanning, watching, and we're, we're right back in the game, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, the breathing is, it's literally everything. It's been such a powerful healing uh, tool for me. It's an incredible way to manipulate energy within your body. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a morning non-negotiable for me, uh, is breath work every single morning. I start with, the uh, the four, seven, eight. I'm sure you, you've heard of that technique. Um, four, seven, four seconds on the inhale, deep into your belly, seven second hold, eight second on the exhale. Um, really again, keeps you in that parasympathetic. Um, and then I go to some intense diaphragmatic that really helps to reset the, uh, the nervous system as well. Um, awesome. 
Awesome. That's yeah. awesome. The, the mouth tape. So going to what you were saying about sleep. Yeah. I, I started sleeping with the mouth tape and man, is it crazy how much better my sleep has gotten. Really? Is it that, that impactful? A hundred percent, because I know when I don't sleep without it, I like sleeping on my back, but if I don't have the mouth tape and I'm on my back, my mouth opens, my mouth is dry. My quality of sleep is just wiped out. Dude, I might even sleep quality is. Yeah. yeah. Or I have to switch onto my side. If I don't have the mouth tape, well, then my shoulder starts hurting. And so I'm just constantly awake. So once I just again you know all the studies and stuff out there in regards to the mouth tape are great but none of those studies were done on me so i want to experiment with it you know so i got it tried it and i'll i'll not go back now it's it's supposed to like help you to train to be able to do it without the mouth tape but i'm not at that not at that level yet that's um, awesome yeah really cool now where where can people find out about you jacob you on social you on do you have a website or anything like that, that your service? Like, yeah. So, so currently I'm, I'm in the process of getting a website. I was doing the mental performance stuff with a partner uh, from up in Canada for about four years. I was a part of his thing. He advised me to not get a website. I think I understand now where that's coming from. So now I'm in the process of getting a website, but I post a lot on LinkedIn, just Jacob Newton. You'll see a picture of me playing. Um, in this three ice league, which we're going to actually be in Minnesota this summer. So maybe oh, I can see that. It. Yeah. Yeah. This will be my, my third year playing. Oh, in so, it. you know, John Schiavo then. Oh yeah. He was on my team last year. Yeah. yeah. He, he was on the pod and um, good friend of mine who I met up here playing adult hockey. Okay. Really, really awesome guy. I've been over to his facility and uh, yeah. his wife's a sweetheart too. They're, they're great people. Yeah, yeah I love, you, I love you had, yeah. Do you have Sluggo as the equipment manager in the? Oh app? yeah, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's my boy. He give he gets me stuff <laughs> that other guys don't get. <laughs> yeah, that's Sluggo for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So yeah, LinkedIn just under Jacob Newton. I uh, just started a new Instagram page where I'm just a hundred percent focused on on content on mental yeah. stuff. Um, and that's you. Newton's Mind Fifty Five. Okay. Yeah. That was um, 55. Yep. And then, and uh, the website eventually is going to be newtonsmind.com, but we're, we're not there yet. Okay. Um, and then I'm on Facebook, but I think I uh, don't even mention that. I'll probably be getting rid of Facebook because it's, it's a, it's a dud for me, <laughs> but um, yeah, like I said, LinkedIn, Jacob Newton, uh, Instagram, Newton's mind 55. And um, yeah, that's about it. Awesome, man. Well, this has been fabulous. It's been great catching up with you. I, like I said a million times, you look fantastic. And I'm happy. I, one, I, I, you know, I read your story and I'm like, wow, I didn't know. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th that's um, impactful. And so I appreciate you sharing that with us. And I appreciate you trying to get the message out and, and help players along the way who don't necessarily have had to have experienced childhood trauma, but maybe they're feeling that anxiety. Maybe they're feeling that pressure. Maybe they're feeling, yeah, like they're feeling that they're not able to produce the best that they're capable of. You can definitely help with that from a mindset perspective. And if you're a player and you're listening to this, reach out to Jacob. I know you can just hear it in his voice, how passionate he is about helping people. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, brother. And again, thank you for, for having me on. It's I'll yeah. never stop sharing the story because again, I, I know that there's so many people out there that feel shame around these things, but I don't carry any shame because it wasn't something I did. It was something that was done to me, you know? Um, but yeah, real quick too, is not everybody has that sore thrum thing that sticks out in regards to their childhood, but I would imagine in, in my learnings, so much performance anxiety so many players suffer from performance anxiety. And I think it's actually rooted more in, in youth hockey and how our closest caretakers, whether that was mom or dad, how they would respond to our bad performances, which I think leads to that anxiety around, oh, I want to play good so that these people feel good about my performance, you know? Um, so even though these guys, I, I, my vision is I'm very good at what I do and I want to be working with NHL guys. Um, because just because they have all of this incredible physical skill 
it doesn't mean that they too don't have the mental struggles that I uh, had, you know, that, that everybody does. Mental health is like, it impacts everyone. It's not one in five, like these big corporations want to say it's five and five, everybody struggles, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, once you understand that it's it, again, it just creates so much more compassion for people, you know? And again, you, you didn't know I had the, the past that I had, you no. know? And, oh, yeah. and so I, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not mad at nobody for not asking me questions for not wondering about why, why are your eyes bloodshot? Like it wasn't ever supposed to be that way, you know? And again, you don't know what you don't know. Um, if I could go back, maybe I would go back and share my story sooner, but it was never going to be that way, you know? So, um, so yeah, thanks again. <laughs> thanks yeah. again. Oh, this Gavin. this has been it. fantastic. Very impactful. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. And uh, more importantly, good to see you again. Absolutely. Thank all you, right. brother. Thanks, Jacob. Hope all is well. Take care.